3.33 a.m. That's the time right now. Just like you, I'm a fiend for scrolling through Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. Most of the time, not really taking in what I'm watching or reading, but being on a sort of social media autopilot navigating from page to page. And just like you, I got to a point where the same pages just didn't do it for me anymore. So, I'm writing this post to give you all a bit of free information. Don't get me wrong, it comes at a price, but you are not forced to play it. I'll explain. After reading countless stories about the dark web and the dangers of what lurks beneath the surface of the internet, I decided to download a Tor browser and see for myself. Now, I know before you even finish that sigh of disappointment at another dark web story, this you need to read. I'm not here to persuade you to not go looking, but quite the opposite. What people say about the dark web is right for the most part. Most of the links are dead, and the ones that are still active are so outdated to what we are used to became a chore to use and the novelty quickly wears off. But hold on in there. You see, lurking behind the active pages is an even bigger kept secret, an even deeper part of the internet that as soon as a user logs into the 90s throwaway replica pages of shady marketplaces and even shadier videos make themselves known to the hidden page admins. They can see what you search for, what's on your hard drive, and even what you have been viewing on the USB stick you keep out of view. And if they think you are worthy, like I was fortunately, they will make themselves known to you, a simple message. Do you want to see more? Yes or no? Click enter. Judge me all you want, I know when I meet our maker, if he exists, I'm not going to be gracing the gates of heaven for long before they cast me down to the fires below. If you knew what was on that USB stick I keep under those loose floorboards in my bedroom, and what was the first things I searched for as soon as I hit the dark web, you would have no doubt I will get what's coming to me. And to an extent, I understand, and I agree. My soul died the day I found the videos I like to watch. Piece by piece fell away from my being each time I pressed play, and heard the screams, watched the blood leaving its host, and the anguish left on their helpless faces. I live a numb existence now. After watching those kind of videos, you lose that sense of feeling, like nothing really matters anymore. Now, you know that can exist in society. I clicked yes without really giving it a second thought. From the full, dull gray, text-heavy website, I was redirected to a red screen, with a picture of an unassuming door at the center and an enter button below. Clicking the button took me to a screen heavily inspired by YouTube. Each video at a time in the bottom corner, and each video averaged a few hours each. Reading through the titles, I instantly knew the kind of side I had entered. Young college girl brutally beaten until she chokes on her own blood. Family mauled to death by pack of dogs. Frat boy takes a claw hammer to the temple. The list went on. The next tab to the videos caught my eye. Be the executioner. You decide. Clicking the tab took me to a live feed. The room was bare, except for a metal chair shackled to the floor with wrist and ankle shackles menacingly laying open, hanging from the joints of the chair. Behind the chair, a table was pushed against the far wall with a filthy green blanket of some sort strewn over the top, concealing the contents of the table. While I took in the details of the room, a man came into view from the left of the screen, closely followed by a petite female, probably in her early 20s, already badly beaten and held by her hair by the man leading the way. Up until now, my room had been silent. But as the sobbing woman came into view, my room erupted with the sound of her whimpering startling me from my trance-like state. I adjusted the sound on my speakers, regained composure, and began reading the menu down the right-hand side of the screen. It looked more like instructions. Dear viewer, well done for making it this far. Most people make it to the first page beyond the door, realize we are the real deal, and nope their way out of here. Well let me tell you this, they all missed a real treat. We are not like most sites, we don't ask for you to log in, we already have your details, we don't ask for payment, 
Money is no object to us. We don't even ask that you stay loyal in return. New people search the dark web daily, and we have plenty of viewer potential. We do, however, ask one thing of everyone who clicks accept at the bottom of the screen. By now, I notice the woman has been shackled to the chair in the middle of the room, and the man is standing just to the right of the chair. His face obscured by a makeshift executioner mask, eyes peering through the mask directly at the camera, directly at me as if waiting for me. All we ask is that you divulge us with the information of your preferred method of death in the way you fear the most. Please don't try to bypass these questions as keystrokes are monitored and non-serious answers will result you in being blocked from the site indefinitely. Please give your answers now. Preferred method of death. How do you fear dying the most? Upon accepting this, you acknowledge that at the end of every show, your answers will be put to a vote by the viewers and you may be selected to be the main attraction of the next show. We will collect you by 9.45 a.m., where you will be subjected to all mediums of torture until the next show at precisely 9 p.m. At 9 p.m., you will then be exposed to the answer you submitted above that gained the most votes until your death. Accept, yes or no, click enter. I input my answers. For the record, I preferred freezing to death and feared being slowly eaten alive by rats and clicked accept. Wait, what was that disclaimer? Never mind the screen. Never mind, the screen came to life. As soon as I clicked accept, the man nodded, turned towards the table, and removed the blanket. Underneath, I could see an industrial sized grater and blowtorch. He picked the tools up and slowly started walking back to the woman. As the clock hit 9 p.m., the man began heating the grater while holding it incredibly close to the woman's now hysterical face. Her screams were going unheard by me and several other viewers. Indicated by the view count in the corner of the screen, I hadn't noticed before now. As it got to just after 3 a.m., the view count had reached 10,642 viewers, and without sharing too much detail, the woman was no longer recognizable. As she lay slumped in her chair, the man stopped in his unrelenting assault on the woman and turned towards the camera again. A list flashed up on the screen with numbers. All I had to do was put a tick in my vote. Strangulation, 150. Mauled by a bear, 1050. Shot point blank with revolver, 526. Drowning, 2186. Cut throat, 2421 beaten to death, 120, freezing to death, 682, eaten alive by rats, 3,507. Congratulations, your method of most feared way to die has been chosen by our viewers. The message popped up on the screen instantly. Please be ready for our arrival at your below address. As I mentioned earlier, I completely agree, what I have done is wrong and I know one day I will pay. Unlike everyone else though, I know my judgment day is today. I need to hit post now. They will be here in a few hours, possibly, so I won't be around to answer questions, if what they say is true. I recommend you check out the site. You never know. You may be lucky like me. You might be picked next. Let me tell you from experience that the deep web is a disgusting human cesspit. You don't know what lies in the darkest recesses of the human psyche until you go on there. I learned that the hard way. I got sucked in by the crazy stories and hype my friends gave it. I wanted to see it for myself. So last week, I downloaded Tor and started browsing. I didn't feel the need for any extra protection, being completely new to the entire concept. In retrospect, I wish I had. I spent hours clicking link after link after link, and I was starting to get bored and a little freaked out. I found a whole host of your typical crackheads searching for drugs, sites with hitmen for hire, and a crap ton of other military grade weaponry. At this point, I found myself scrolling through post after post of vivid descriptions of animal abuse and how sick people who committed those atrocities get off to them every night. 
I wish I had closed my computer right then and there, but something kept my curiosity alight. Honestly, I think some part of me just wanted to see how screwed up the human mind truly could be. After a few more links to CP, in a couple drug markets, I had had enough. This is it. I sighed to myself. One more link and I swear I'm getting out of this hellhole. I clicked the link, going blindly into what, unbeknownst to me, would alter my already cynical views on humanity. I mean, honestly, when you hear a guy go on and on about lighting his dog on fire and watching it writhe, you tend not to think the best of people. But this, this was a whole new level of twisted. The first thing that caught my eye was the curly pink font that served as a title of the opening page. It read, Peace and Love. I remember it all too clearly, as it seemed so out of place in that slum of human refuse formerly known as the Deep Web. I scrolled down to find an image album and a simple chat box. No one was online at the moment, so I went ahead and clicked the first set of pictures. I was not ready for what I was about to see. The very first picture was that of a young pregnant woman, bawling her eyes out. She looked scrawny and thin, with cuts and bruises marring her pale skin. She looked scared and malnourished, like she was begging for her life. I clicked to the next photo and nearly vomited. The young woman from before now sat in a chair, facing the camera, her dead, dull eyes boring into me. She was covered in blood and her abdomen had been torn open. In her cold, unfeeling arms, she held the child, still attached at the umbilical cord. Its half-formed, lifeless body was a deep crimson with blood, and one could tell it had been forcibly ripped from the womb. On the wall just behind them, written in their blood were the words, I gave them peace, in harsh, hasty letters. I don't know what possessed me to scroll through the photos. It was as if I couldn't control my own facilities. The images only got more and more grotesque as I looked further. The following images seemed to be a time lapse on the decomposition of the body. I watched them rot, sitting there together. I watched the face of the mother, which could have been once been considered beautiful, wither and collapse in on itself as a fetid mount of flesh. By the end of the series of images, they were nothing but desiccated skeletons. I would have noped it the hell out of there had it had not been for a message that popped on my screen. It was from the website chat. It read exactly as follows. Hello there. Do you like what you see? Do you want more? Do you want to attain true peace? I didn't know how to respond. I was rooted to my chair with fear. Then the sicko spoke again. You don't have to be scared, Zachary. I love you. I want to help you. Let me help you. I managed to type a simple question. How in the name of hell do you know my name? Almost immediately, I got a response. I know everything about you. You know, you really shouldn't leave your curtains open like that. You get a draft. You see, I just want to help you. Please, let me save you. My eyes flashed to the uncovered window behind me to the light of my webcam. My heart skipped a beat when I realized it was on. The sick person was watching me. I made a move to pull the plug on this sick son of a bitch when another message popped up. Don't try to shut me out. I'll bring you peace. I swear, Zachary Tanner. It's the only real bliss in this world. That was the last message I got, but before I finally shut it off. Needless to say, I stayed off the internet for a long while after that. Just today, I got back on praying to God that it would have all blown over. Oh, how wrong I was. I logged into my email, only to find it spammed with emails from an account named I'll Show You Peace. Each one had the same message. I want to save you. I want to love you. I want to bring you peace. In all caps. But that wasn't even the worst of it. Each and every message had a candid photo of me taken within the last week. I've tried to involve the police but they haven't been much help. What do I do? Allow me to preface this by saying that I never used the deep web for anything too bad. I never bought drugs. I never stole movies or music. I had the most generous wife you could ever imagine. 
I had always been fascinated by computers, but the town I grew up in was a small hick town, if that. I remember hearing about computers and the internet, and the idea of it blew me away. Being able to access information from anywhere in the world was amazing, and it astounded me that it wasn't embraced and pursued by more people. So, I not only lived in a technology desert, but my family wasn't exactly rich either. My mom slaved away at a large corporation, where she was paid much less than she was worth. My dad worked various odd jobs, but always invested most of his time into the local church. He was a stereotypical Bible thumper, and as one might expect, I grew to resent the religion. I always felt like religion was a one-way street. They expected me to pray to and serve some deity in the sky, and all those who don't would burn in hell. My interest in history led me to the realization that every religion was similar in that regard, and that, for me, was enough to dismiss them all. Thankfully, they raised my sister and me to work hard. We both went to college and got decent jobs. She became a nurse and moved to New York. I followed my passion for history, and eventually became a world history teacher at a small high school. I married my high school sweetheart shortly after getting my teaching job, and we moved into a more populated suburb, not too far from where I grew up. We found a nice house that was close enough to both of our jobs. My wife and I had been saving up money because we were trying to have a child, although it was taking longer than we thought. After about a year of trying, we saw a doctor. He said that we were both able and healthy, but it would take some more time. This was almost nice in a way, because we had more money than we needed for when the baby came. I decided to take a few hundred dollars and get the computer I'd been dreaming about for years. I was so excited when my wife agreed that I should. We couldn't raise a kid in this day and age without a computer after all, right? Well, I put it in our home office, and I quickly became enamored with the thing. I can honestly say that my life would have been so much better if I had one of these growing up. I could literally learn anything in the world I wanted. I found myself reading dozens of articles, speeches, books, and watching tutorials. I could not have been any happier. Time marched on and I found myself finishing up the semester and getting ready for the summer. It got pretty boring, honestly. I still got paid for it, but because the school was such a crappy district, there weren't many things for teachers to get involved in over the summer. That was when my genuine interest in the internet became something of an addiction. I was on that thing at nearly all hours of the day. Since my wife and I were still trying to have a baby, we were having sex like two animals. Life could not have gotten any better. Unfortunately, when things got that good, they can only get worse. It was a month and a half through the summer vacation when I found myself reading the same crap on the internet. There was nothing new, or at the very least, nothing worth learning about. However, I did recall hearing about something strange. It was called the deep web. I never studied it in depth, but I eventually had a basic understanding of it. I downloaded Tor and started looking around online. I made sure to be extra careful when I have heard stories of people being stalked, kidnapped, or even killed from using the deep web. I found myself staring at dozens of random links on the hidden wiki at 3 o'clock in the morning. I kept clicking away until something, anything useful, came up. I did end up finding a lot of mathematics and science stuff, but I'm a history teacher. I'd rather learn about history. A few more hours of searching, and I found something that at least remotely piqued my interest. It was a conspiracy theory page. Now, I don't consider myself to be anything of a conspiracy theorist, nor am I the least bit paranoid about things like the Illuminati. But these were some of the most solid arguments for foul play from the government I had ever seen. They were classified documents, in-depth research, and an overwhelming amount of evidence for almost every theory I saw. Don't get me wrong, there were a few that seemed a bit far-fetched, but the vast majority of them made some damn good arguments. Eventually, I couldn't hold my eyes open any longer and I had to go to bed. I powered down my computer, and as quiet as a mouse, crawled into bed with my tender loving wife. I felt a bit of a void between us though. She never had the lust for knowledge like I did, and if I were ever to tell her about the crazy and interesting things I read online, 
She'd playfully tease me that she was falling asleep or something to that effect. The next day, I was right back on the deep web, looking for new things to widen my world view. Nearly an hour had gone by, and all I had found was a bunch of broken links. I was about to sign off, when a box appeared in the corner of my screen with a link in it. Being as naive as I was, I clicked on it. I was absolutely mortified at what I saw next. At first glance, I thought the abomination on my computer screen was some kind of torture video. No, I was dead wrong. A toddler whimpered as he sat there, gagged and bound, covered in blood and piss. He begged the man in the frame to stop, but to no avail. A deranged man in a guy fox mask stared at the camera as he thrust his body to and from. A few seconds went by when the man finished, and he got up to do a strange dance. If there was a cross between a football player's victory dance and a circus clown's opening act, the resulting atrocity might resemble the strange act the man performed over that poor child. To my horror, I realized it was a live feed hooked up to a webcam and a live chat box on the side. It took a few minutes for the shocking realization to fully wash over me. After I'd collected myself, I foolishly started to read what was in the live chat box. The most horrid and disgusting things you can imagine were being requested. I had a hard time believing that real people were behind a keyboard somewhere in the world typing these things. I really don't want to go into too much detail about what they were saying. It suddenly dawned on me that I could just close this and be over with it. I jolted the mouse and clicked X out of the page, but nothing happened and I felt my stomach drop. What the hell is going on here? I kept asking myself. I never heard of anything like this happening. I was about to manually reboot my computer when the man from the video stream called out my full name. Leaving so soon, Mr. Edwards? Off to teach another history lessons at that little shithole you call a high school? He asked in a rough, distorted tone. I had no idea what to do. I clicked every button on the computer, keyboard, and mouse. No matter what I did, there was no reaction. I heard him start reading off my credit card information, and I'd had enough. I unplugged my computer from the back and powered it down. It was a relief to have finally left that nightmare of a web page. I was in awe at the speed he was able to get my personal information. I changed my credit card number and any other information I could. My wife was a bit suspicious, but she didn't pry too much at it. We had a very trusting relationship, and I didn't want to frighten her so I kept the incident to myself. A few days went by, and I didn't even go into the office. I left my computer in there unplugged, admittedly scared to turn that damn thing on ever again. I knew I'd have to eventually face my fear, so I entered the office. I booted her up and everything seemed to be normal. I deleted Tor and made sure to be done with the deep web. I casually loaded up Google Chrome and everything seemed to be perfectly fine. Nothing seemed to come to fruition from my little mishap and decided I was going to be safe after all. Oh, how wrong I was. About five months later, my wife's sister ended up moving in. She really was such a pleasant woman, and we did have extra space so we decided to allow her to stay with us. It was just a few weeks later that my wife and I got the good news. She was pregnant. She was already a couple weeks in, and she and the baby were both healthy and in good shape. It was the best feeling in the world, getting that news. I had gotten back into the swing of things with my job and occasionally reading some decent articles on the internet. It wasn't long before we were days away from the birth of our daughter. I had completely forgotten about the events that had transpired the night I decided to use the deep web. It was a typical Sunday afternoon. I sat on my back porch drinking some cold sweet tea and listening to the hum of nature. Natural life can be so beautiful. Alone, I sat, in a serene peace, seemingly impenetrable, from the vile world that lay outside the boundaries of my own little haven. That was when I heard a crash and screaming coming from my house. Immediately, I thought it was my sister-in-law watching TV too loud, which she had a tendency to do. But then, I heard my wife sobbing uncontrollably. Panic sunk into my heart and I dashed into the house. I entered the large living room, just in time to see a large masked man kill my wife. I screamed at him, but he didn't even acknowledge my existence. 
I was screaming uncontrollably and ran towards him with intent to kill. I smashed a glass lamp over his head, but he didn't even flinch. I was questioning if he even felt it or not. He turned around and grabbed me by my throat. He lifted me up off the ground and brought my face close to his. You thought I forgot about you, boy? I instantly recognized him as the man from the deep web livestream I saw all those months ago. That was the last thing I remembered before waking up. I awoke to see my sister-in-law's mangled corpse on the floor. It looked like she'd been cut in half. To my horror, I saw my beloved wife's body there, drenched in blood. I sobbed uncontrollably for some time. I'm still not sure how much time passed while I knelt there and sobbed. Time may very well have stood still for all I knew or cared, but after I composed myself, I noticed something strange about my wife's corpse. Her stomach was not nearly as large as I had remembered it to be. I crawled over to analyze her body further. The wicked idea danced across my imagination. I pushed her on her side, and my hunch turned out to be true. That sick bastard had cut my child out of my wife and had taken it. It was certainly far long enough to have been born at this point. What the hell was I going to do? I called the police, and the operator's apparent apathy toward the situation did nothing but anger me. 911, what's your emergency? The operator said in an uninterested tone. Someone killed my family, and I think they took my daughter. I frantically let out in a single breath. I continued to tell them my address. We'll have someone over there as soon as we can. The way she said that frustrated me. Here I am. Sitting in a puddle of my own family's blood, my life has been drastically changed forever, and she makes it seem as if it's just another day at the office. Where's the empathy? Where's the compassion for your fellow human being? After days of investigation and questioning, they were unable to find the killer or my daughter. I told those lazy cops that this man found me and my family because I used the deep web, but because it was so long ago, and I couldn't find the website again, they couldn't do anything about it. They called it a random act of heinous violence, and within two weeks. The story did make the local news, but nothing more happened than that. I guess it wasn't shocking enough. The whole incident was forgotten, and people were worried about the next terrible thing. How could I live with myself after this? My entire family was dead because I was snooping around something I had no business to be partaking in. The following weeks were the worst of my life. I would drink as soon as I got up, and then drink all day. Alcohol was the only escape from the screwed up reality I had to live with. I was a shell of a human, nothing more than a cluster of negative, hideous emotions. Misery became my only companion, but I had no one to be miserable with. I had to live this horrible fate alone. Years had gone by when I looked into the mirror to see the unshaven face I'd come to despise. Every day, I thought about where my daughter might be. Maybe they've sent her away to live with a nice loving family across the country. I half-heartedly deluded myself. Deep down, I knew she was most likely raised in some human trafficking ring, where she'd be beaten, hard, and even worse, in some hellhole filled with these sick people. I slowly made my way to my porch when I saw a familiar vehicle pull into my driveway. I could barely remember who it belonged to. When I saw his face, I instantly recognized him. It was my father. I hadn't seen him in years. Son, I know you're hurting, but this is no way to live your life. Do you think you can move on? I looked up at him, grimacing. Do you think I'd be here doing this if I could move on? He gave me a rough look and said that I needed to get revenge. He placed a revolver on the table in front of me, gave me a stern nod, and left. I was honestly shocked. This was the most religious man I'd known in my life who argued against the killing of any kind. I didn't know if I could do it, but I started to think of how many people those bastards have done this to. I can't be the only one. So, if I were to theoretically go through with this, I'd really be doing the world a service. No, screw that. I'm avenging my family, and I'm going to save my daughter. Over the next couple of days, I drained my bank account and purchased thousands of dollars in weaponry and ammunition. I quickly realized there was a lot of illegal stuff that would come in handy. I turned back to the deep web to buy spying equipment, heavy weapons, and explosives. 
It took about a month to gather enough supplies for my mission, and as I sat in my basement with thousands of rounds of ammunition, pounds of explosives, and almost $20,000 in spying equipment, I knew I was going to wreak havoc on these people once and for all. Days went by, and I began to feel lethargic about the whole situation. I hadn't any idea of how I was going to find these people, or even if I could. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Two weeks went by of endless hours on the deep web, looking for the bastard who'd taken my family away from me. I came across something that seemed almost familiar in a way. It was another live stream of people torturing a child. I felt a vile hatred rise up from the pit in my stomach. I knew this wasn't my guy, but I'd grown too impatient to wait any longer. If I can't find the needle in the haystack, I guess I'm just going to have to burn down the entire thing. I thought to myself with hatred oozing from my pores. I made use of some of the spying equipment I bought and was able to figure out where these bastards were broadcasting from. An evil grin stretched across my face when I figured out they were right here in my own state. I loaded my car with a machine gun, an AK-47, and C4. I started my drive. This may have been the longest two hours of my life. I was so excited to finally kill some of these sick, disgusting people. After almost taking a wrong turn, I found the rusty old barn house with torture was being broadcasted from. There were surprisingly only a few people there. A total of four men were running this operation. I watched for a while, but they never came out of the barn house. With my AK-47 in hand, I made my way to the entrance. I could see them aring a small boy, no older than 12. He was crying hysterically and covered in blood. They were completely oblivious to me. I aimed my rifle's sight down. Admittedly, it took me a minute to actually pull the trigger. Pulling it was much harder than I would have thought, but seeing these sickos violate this defenseless child made me realize these people really were better off dead. I opened fire and screamed, Screw you! as loud as my lungs would permit. From what I could tell, at least two of them were dead. One shot, but alive, and the fourth noticed quickly enough to get behind a truck. He had a pistol on him and fired back at me. This guy must have been legally blind or something, because he missed pretty damn bad. Minutes went by and I slowly crept around to the other side of the building. The one with the gun was screaming at the other one to get up, but he was clearly unable to. I got as close to the other gunman as I could in preparation to kill him. I aimed my sight but I must have made a noise because he heard me. He spun around and shot. The bullet nearly grazed my skull. The shot was deafening. I ran toward him, expecting him to have just fired his last shot. He had. I put a bullet through that person's head. I stood over his bloodied corpse for a brief minute. I wanted to spit on it, but I didn't want to leave any evidence for the cops, so I resisted the urge. I walked over to the bloodied one I shot earlier. Laughing as I did, I placed my boot on his throat. He kept begging for his life, but there was a better chance of hell freezing over before I spared him. I made sure his last minutes on this earth were as miserable as possible. Glaring down at this sick man, I knew I was doing the right thing. I knew I was ridding the world of scum. Please, don't kill me. This wasn't my idea. He begged. What did you say? You have the nerve to try and talk your way out of your inevitable death? How dare you? I pulled my leg back, and in one swift motion, I kicked his skull in. His gray matter spilled all over the floor. The poor boy was sobbing uncontrollably. I pulled out my prepaid cell phone, dialed 911, and told them the situation. I told the boy to forget this night, and then turned to walk away. The ride home seemed to drag on for hours. I'd heard so many things about having PTSD after killing people. So many articles online said that after killing someone, you'd almost always feel guilty, even if you knew you did the right thing. But the truth was, I didn't feel guilty at all. It felt powerful. More powerful than I'd ever felt in the years leading up to this day. I knew after I saw that babbling pile of crap beg for his life, that I was going to kill again. It felt so right to have someone begging for their life, and knowing that you weren't going to grant them their wish made it all the more satisfying. My life continued like that for many months. 
I'd spend almost all my free time on the dark web trying to track down anything that could lead me to my daughter and killing anyone I deemed worthy to die. I was like an over-the-top vigilante or something. Jesus, those were the days. Eventually, I became more involved in the private sector and started accepting payments to kill people. I'd gained enough notoriety in the criminal world that almost anyone knew who I was. I just wish I could go back in time and tell myself how much more money I could make by simply killing people. It makes me realize what a waste of my life teaching those hopeless kids really was. I was making chump change compared to what I make now. People apparently pay good money to have someone killed. I'd already made just under 3 million in the past 6 months. And I didn't even have to repeat the same monotonous lecture 7 times in a day. I almost became apathetic about ever finding my daughter again. She was most likely dead, or even worse, she could be anywhere in the world. And the odds of ever finding her were next to none, I thought. One day, a connection of mine told me he had a really good gig set up. He said that if I could kill three people well enough, I could become a regular for an underground overlord. For those of you that don't know, this was the kind of guy who had more money than God. He ran a lot of the underground operations and even had a strong affiliation with the Silk Road before it got shut down. I knew this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, so I jumped at the chance. I went over the information. I immediately realized these were going to be the highest profile people I would ever kill. When I first discovered I was going to have to kill a family with a young child, I was mortified. The only people I have had to kill up to this point had been other criminals and sadists. How was I going to bring myself to take the lives of a seemingly innocent family? I would never even know why exactly I was being hired to kill them. You can't ask questions like that to the higher ups though. Anyone who did was normally killed themselves, or at the very least, ostracized by the organization they were trying to work for. It was a pretty serious business I got myself into. I had no problem with that. I only did what I was told, and nothing more. That was part of the reason I gained so much notoriety in my field. In fact, most people in the field never even got a chance to work for the Overlord. And if you're wondering why I keep referring to him as the Overlord, it is because he does not communicate with you directly. There are a lot of people looking for him, and he's responsible for billions in damage, and the loss of countless innocent lives, although they don't have a lot of information on him as of right now, and will probably never catch him. The next day, I was going to have to start tracking down this family I was ordered to kill, but that night, I was in a small bar in the middle of nowhere, downing alcohol like there was no tomorrow and contemplating how exactly I was going to bring myself to do this. I knew in the pit of my stomach that I wasn't a murderer. Well, let me rephrase that. Not a murderer of the innocent. I had no problem killing the evil men of the earth. I encountered so many sickos in my life. How could someone torture an animal or another person? I still can bring myself to understand how anyone could do such a thing. Even if I found the man who kidnapped my daughter, I wouldn't torture him. I'd end his pathetic life and be done with him. Even after all the pain and agony that bastard put me through, I still knew I was better than him. I wouldn't become the monster that I sought to destroy. The bar began spinning after I downed my fifth shot, and I immediately came to regret this. I didn't feel threatened by the few others in the bar before, but once I lost control of myself, it seemed as if I became all that much more paranoid. I became so much more vulnerable to those around me, and I couldn't die just yet. I knew the events that were soon to come would be life-altering. I had this great feeling about this next job and the opportunities it would bring, which is quite unusual. I never feel intuitive like this. With hopes of surviving until tomorrow, I drunkenly made my way back to the motel I was staying in. The snow and ice outside made it much more difficult to get there. As sad as it is to say, I ended up falling three times before I got home and locked the door. It wasn't a far walk. But adding strong alcohol to any walk makes it seem like a journey around the entire globe. I lay down, and the thought of becoming the most powerful criminal in the world rushed through my mind before I went to the realm of the unconscious. That night, I dreamt that I was a hero destined to save the world. The next morning, my ears were assaulted by the alarm I'd set on my phone. I downed a couple of aspirins to cope with the headache and got to work. 
The family I was going to be attacking lived in a relatively populated area, and I knew if I was going to pull this off, it would have to be quiet. I sharpened three separate knives and placed them in my coat pocket. The idea of bringing one of those blades to the little girl rushed through my mind and made me sick, but I knew that sacrifices were going to have to be made. I knew I had to be bad for the greater good. Unfortunately, I'll never even know why I'm killing this family, but I did my best to separate myself from the idea that these were good people. They had to have done something pretty bad to have powerful criminals hiring Hitman to kill them, right? I drove my SUV to their neighborhood and parked down the street at 3 o'clock. Looking toward their backyard, I could see the father, Ronnie Williams, on the back porch. I knew I was going to have to kill him with the next half hour. I knew I was going to have to kill him within the next half hour because the mother, Bridget Williams, would be picking up their daughter from school and would arrive home at 3.30 every day. I thought to myself how easy this job was to do since someone else had done the monotonous task of stalking these people and recording their schedule. I locked my vehicle and started walking towards the house. I knew where they kept their extra key in the front yard garden and made my way into the house from the front. I waited for Ronnie to come back into the house for 10 minutes before I started to become impatient. I was going to need time to hide the body, I thought, and I knew I needed to do this fast before Bridget and her daughter got home. I decided to push something over in the kitchen and hid behind the refrigerator as Mr. Williams slowly crept into the house saying hello. I realized how truly inept this guy was by this. I waited until he came close enough and I reached over to cut him. He screamed, much to my dismay. I tackled him and plunged the knife into him, clearly cutting his head off. Watching the blood drip onto the floor and drained, he screamed, much to my dismay. I tackled him and killed him with a knife, nearly cutting his head off. Watching the blood drip onto the floor drained me in some way. I sat over the lifeless body of a man who never saw me coming. I collected myself and dragged his body to the basement. My goal was to leave no evidence for the police to find. Making my way up the stairs, I heard the front door opening. I remembered the blood all over the kitchen floor. Crap! I said to myself. I heard the woman and her daughter starting screaming at the sight of the gruesome murder. I quickly rushed upstairs. Ma'am, I need you and your daughter to remain calm. I'm part of the FBI. I'm afraid a murderer has made his way into your house earlier this day, I said. I want to see some identification, the woman abruptly demanded. I pulled out my fake badges I always carried around and showed it to them. Anyone who knew anything about federal badges would easily detect it was a fake, but most people don't. Is my husband alright? She asked me. I told her he was downstairs. She slowly made her way down the basement stairs and I followed closely behind. When she located her husband, she fell to her knees and began sobbing. That was when I pulled out my knife and slit. That was when I pulled out my knife and killed her from behind. She was dead within seconds. Now for the hard part, I thought to myself. I made my way back upstairs to find the little girl. She was nowhere in sight. I frantically looked all over the house, but she was nowhere to be found. I grew increasingly worried. I knew I was being watched by the overlord, and if he saw this clearly display of incompetence, it would hurt any chances I had of working for him. I began walking up the creaky wooden stairs to continue my search. I knew I heard a sound coming from behind the door. I slowly and quietly made my way towards it. I wrapped my hand around the shiny doorknob and began to turn. A large German Shepherd dog jumped up on me, biting my arm. This caught me by surprise. I'd been wondering where that damn dog was. I struggled with the beast on top of me for a few moments, but it was not long that I had my blade through its skin and its blood soaking the cold wooden floor. After composing myself, I continued my search for the girl. This girl is barely six years old, I thought. Where could she have gone? There were enough rooms in this house that this could take a while, but I knew the longer I was here, the worse it was for me. I checked each room in the house thoroughly but found nothing. That was when I remember the girl's father had built a fort in the backyard for her. That has to be where she is. I began outside and exited the back door to the porch. I saw that the small makeshift door on the fort was closed and knew I'd find her in there. I walked over and opened the door to the fort. She screamed as I forcefully pulled her out of the fort. All her energy was spent trying to free herself. I tried calming her down but to no avail. 
She was crying and sobbing uncontrollably. I brought her back inside to finish the job. I threw her to the floor and mentally readied myself to drive my knife through the little girl's heart. I could feel my own moral compass screaming at me to stop this madness. It was hard enough to kill the parents. How was I going to kill their daughter now too? I closed my eyes and brought my knife close to her chest. She was screaming, but I did my best to distance myself from the whole situation as much as I could. I closed my eyes and began to focus. The screaming stopped and I opened my eyes to see the lifeless corpse of the little girl oozing blood onto the floor. I started sobbing as the realization of my actions washed over me like a tidal wave of guilt and regret. I had to do it. I had to do it. I kept telling myself, yes, you did. A strange voice exclaimed behind me. It sounded really familiar, but I had no idea where I heard it before. I turned around to see a large mass man standing behind me. He began to spoke. I know this whole ordeal had been difficult for you, killing your own daughter and such, but I'm... What did you just say? This was my daughter? But my daughter has been dead for years, I said, cutting him off. What do you think I did when I kidnapped her from you, Johnny boy? I stole her from you and gave her to a loving couple, incapable of having a child of their own. And honestly, they did a much better job of raising her than you ever could have. He calmly stated, Why did you do this to me? Because I can. And if you even think of attacking me, a bullet will be through your head so fast, your head will spin. I didn't know what to do. I fell to my knees and began sobbing. Why did I let this happen? Why God? Why? What was the point of any of this? I thought there was something strange about her. How could I have been so stupid? People always say when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks back. As I stood over the corpse of my dead daughter, looking into her eyes of the man who would led me down the road to hell. I knew I was no longer looking down towards a monster. I was looking at an equal. The amount of self-loathing and hatred that lurked in my soul left me devoid of any other feelings. I knew that I was even more despicable than the monster that dragged me down here. For he, at least, knew he was doing wrong. I have been nothing but a vigilante masquerading as a hero. I'm no hero, and never was. It's ironic in a way. I became the very thing I set out to destroy. I looked up at the overlord and said, did I pass the test? He looked pleased with my response and nodded his head. He extended his arm to help me up. After getting back up, I lunged at him and managed to place a knife in him. As I did, a bullet flew by. It was so close that I felt the air from the bullet on my skin. I was so lucky to have made it out of there alive. I still don't know how I even managed it at all though. After achieving that small piece of justice that I'd been waiting for, everything else was a blur. I wrote this as soon as I got home. Thinking back on the whole thing, it seems surreal. What a terrible time it has been this last little while. I don't think I want to continue very much longer though. I miss my family. I miss my unborn daughter. When I'm done writing this, I think I might just join them. This all started a week ago, when I lost my job and was running behind on bills. I lived in a simple house, and that job was all that held my life together. After a night of drinking and watching TV, I started looking for a new job. Most of them looked boring, just 9-5 to five office jobs, but one caught my eye. It was an ad to the side of the screen that read, High Paying Jobs for Hire. This isn't just your normal 9 to 5 job. In desperation, I clicked on the shady ad. Slowly but surely a new website loads, with multiple links to different jobs with different descriptions. Deep web jobs. House sitting, $100 per shift. Stay in the camera room, watch all rooms, keep the house safe, rules in link. Seems easy, I thought to myself. God, do I regret that. Crop harvest, $150 per field. Harvest a field of corn. Tools are provided. Rules in link. Reading down all the jobs, the house sitting seemed the easiest. So I clicked on the link, eager for the $100.
On the screen, a sign-up sheet popped up, asking for my email. I typed it in quickly and was met with the message, We hope to see you soon. Satisfied with that, I hopped in bed and turned off the lights. I start to drift off when I hear a buzz from my phone. Irritated, I get up and check it. A new email. I thought to myself. I clicked on the notification. Your application has been accepted. Thank you for applying to the house sitting job. You will stay at the house from 12 a.m. until 4 a.m. and you must follow these rules. Your money will arrive at 6 a.m. after your shift. Always, no matter what you hear or see, stay in the camera room. Either don't bring your phone, or if you do, do not turn it on. Even if you get a notification, I will not email you during your shift. Make sure to bring something that you can play music fairly loudly. Arrive at 12 or a little before 12. If you arrive past 12, do not enter the house and send me an email. From 12 to 1, you are allowed to roam the house, but make sure to be in the upstairs camera room by 1. Turn all lights off, lock the doors, and close the blinds. From 1 until 2, watch the cameras. If you see a man in the living room watching TV, turn that camera off until you hear the TV turn off from downstairs. Ignore any sounds you hear around the house. If you feel anything touch you, stop moving and close your eyes until the feeling goes away. From 2 to 3 a.m., open the blinds in the camera room. If you hear a voice from the window, do not look at them. The conversation will be normal, and once they say goodbye, it is safe to close the blinds. This event can happen any time in the hour. If you see a woman cooking in the kitchen, you have a blue button on your desk that turns on a loud sound in the kitchen. Press and hold that button until the woman disappears. From 3 to 3.30 a.m., turn on your music device as loud as possible. Cover your ears, close your eyes, and ignore any sounds or movements around you. If the music stops, make any sound of your own to drown out what is happening around you. After 3.33 a.m., you are allowed to roam the house until 4. Do not leave before 4, and do not leave more than 5 minutes after 4. If any rules are not completed correctly, hide under the desk and do not move until 4. That is all. Your shift starts tomorrow night at 471 Peterson Drive. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I must have read that email 10 times over. Thinking this was a prank or something, no way do I actually have to follow these crazy rules. I thought to myself, entranced at how specific the rules were. I put my phone back down to charge and went to sleep, still confused by that email. All I could do the next day was think about what that email said. Man in the living room, woman in the kitchen, conversation with a person in the window. It all seemed too crazy to be true. But I couldn't help but find myself 15 minutes before 12, with an old iPod in my pocket, staring at 471 Peterson Drive. I entered the house. It had sort of an old but still livable vibe to it. The house was dusty, but the kitchen and living room were spotless. I made my way upstairs, and at the end of the long hallway stood the camera room. It was barren and small, with nothing but a chair, a camera monitor, and a couple of windows in it. I sat down in the chair. Man, I hope this is worth it. It wasn't. Looking at the computer's clock, it's 12.03. I have one hour to look around the house. First, I head back to the living room, close the blinds, lock the doors, and turn the lights off. Repeat that for all the rooms, and at 12.56, I was back to the camera room. As soon as it hit 1 a.m., I felt a sudden dread, telling me to get up and leave right now. I turned on all the cameras, and on the back of my neck, it felt as if a feather was resting on it. I froze. Keep calm, Chris. Keep calm. I closed my eyes as I remembered the rules. It felt like hours. That feather tickling the back of my neck. But I held out. Not moving and keeping my eyes closed. The feather went away. I opened my eyes, relieved, and heard behind me slow, coordinated footsteps. I whipped around. The footsteps went away 
and a slow chuckle came from the camera speaker. The man was watching TV. The TV was lit up with some cooking show, and the man was chuckling while watching the show. I turned that camera off, and hoped I had done it fast enough. The sound from the TV echoed up the stairs, chilling me to the bone. What the hell is this place? I thought to myself, feeling queasy. And how is it only 1.20 a.m.? The next 20 minutes were as creepy as can be. Unknown sounds bounced around the house, the man laughing at the TV, watching all the cameras until the silence hit me hard. The TV had been turned off, and dread had fell upon me again. The noise from the TV had been a constant for the past 20 minutes, but now that it was off, the silence felt threatening. I slowly turned on the camera and found the room to be empty. I sighed in relief. For what felt like an eternity, my eyes darted around the cameras, on edge, until the clock made a quiet beep, and it turned two o'clock. I rose from my chair and opened the blinds, revealing the pitch black lawn outside. I sat back down, as the clanging of pots and pans ringing in my ears. I looked down at the blue button beside the monitor, then at the lady, now cooking black eggs in the kitchen, and as I was about to press the button, Hi Chris. A woman's voice came from the window. I froze, gluing my eyes to the monitor, forcing myself not to look at the window. Hi, hi, how was your, your day? My voice was shaky. It was obvious that I was scared. I was just strolling around the neighborhood, saw you were here, and I just wanted to say hi. The window she was talking to me through was high enough up from the ground that you needed a large ladder to get to. How was your day? My day... My day was... It was f fine. Thanks. The woman in the kitchen started to get louder. Okay, well, I have to go. It was nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you, too. Bye. I wanted to get up. I wanted to just close the blinds and never hear her voice again. But something just told me that I should not get up. Wow. You're a smart one. I thought that would get you. Hmm, maybe next time. Goodbye. I waited a few seconds. The last thing I wanted to see was the face of that lady talking to me. So I waited until I was sure she wasn't there anymore, then closed the blinds. Once the ordeal was over, I realized that the lady in the kitchen was gone, even though I never pressed the button. Oh no. Oh, no, no, no. I thought, I had broken one of the rules, and it was only 2.30. Now, I'm sitting under the desk typing this out of my iPod, and there's a lady with a ragged apron on, walking in circles around the room. I'm scared to make any noise, so please, if you see an ad for dark web jobs, don't click it. Update. It's 4.30 now. I made it out of the house and I'm safe. My left leg is hurt a little. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you what happened. The lady from the kitchen walked around the room, making soft groans and drooling everywhere. I kept as silent as I could. Freezing time, she turned in my direction. A small beep came from on the desk, notifying me that it had turned 3 a.m. The lady in my room melted into the floorboards, screaming a scream of the utmost agony and pain. What I was supposed to do at this point was turn on the music on my iPod, close my eyes and cover my ears, but hiding under the desk. I didn't know if I still had to do that. I waited and waited, and silence was all I could find, until the walls of the floor of the house started to contort. The house shifted and moved into what looked like faces popping out of the walls. The only description of the sound I can think of is a scream of terror itself. I couldn't take it anymore. My mind told me to get up, to run, to get out as fast as I can, but I knew I couldn't. I closed my eyes and turned the music on. The screams were drowned out, and it seemed almost calming. But in the back of my mind, I knew what was happening around me. The music blared loudly, and my eyes stayed glued shut. Then, the music turned off. I opened my eyes and the house was normal again. Shakily, I stood up and looked at the clock. 3.34 a.m. 
I got back under the desk and lay there, terrified, but nothing happened and I was sitting there for 35 minutes until the final beat from the clock came, telling me I could finally leave. I got up, walked down the hallway, down the stairs to the front door, and finally the sweet cool air of the night hit my face, and in that moment I felt a relief that was almost euphoric. I walked home and picked up my phone, but when I went to email Mr. Salazar, his email was gone, the website was gone, and there was no trace of him at all. I tried to fall asleep, but I couldn't get the faces out of my head. They look like they had, can't be explained. I don't know if I'm going to get my money, but at this point, I don't care. I just never want to go back to that house again. It's now 6am. A package somehow appeared at my door, and inside was $80 in a letter. The letter is as follows. You can't escape. Hello again. I see that you showed up for your shift this morning. I appreciate that, but during your shift, you broke one of the rules. I've taken $20 off your pay because of that. I'm pretty sure you're already aware, but I can tell. You don't want to go back. Most people don't, and I'm here to say you can't escape. By entering that house, you pretty much signed your soul away. No matter what you do, you will always be at that house by 12. That is all. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. My sleep last night was horrible. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened on my first shift. The whole day I stayed in bed, terrified for midnight to come. But it had to come eventually. 11.57, I begged that nothing would happen to me. 11.58, I put my iPod in the trash. 11.59, I lay in bed and closed my eyes. I feel pressure on my feet, and my soft bed disappears from under me. I open my eyes and find myself inside that cursed house again, with my iPod and a printed paper of the rules in my hands. What? How is this possible? I think to myself. I ran to the door, slamming my fist against it, wanting any way out, but to no avail, I couldn't leave. I defeatedly walked up the stairs and sat in the camera room chair. I sat there, crying for an hour, until 1am came, and with it, came the man laughing at the TV. I turned the camera off and continued to sob, not caring about the sounds around me, and then, I felt a hand wrap around my neck. I froze closed my eyes and tried to control myself. The grip closed tighter and tighter until I could barely breathe. Then, it finally left me alone. I gasped for air and grabbed the printed paper of rules given to me at the start of my shift. I looked at the printed sheet of rules and at the bottom was a handwritten message from Mr. Salazar himself. Good luck. I looked back up at the cameras and composed myself. <sighs> okay, Chris, you can do this. You've already been here once. Pull it together. I listened, not hearing the TV anymore. I turned the camera on and the clock let out a small beep. It had turned 2 a.m. I stood up to open the blinds but hesitated. Did I really want to talk to her again? Regardless, I pushed the thought away and opened the blinds to be met with a face only insane people would call a woman. It looked as if she had been eaten once in her life. Her skin looked like it was airtight to her bones, and she had no meat in her body. Her smile was literally ear to ear. Her skin sagged down at least two feet, and her eye sockets had large, black, bloodshot eyes with tiny, beady, yellow pupils. Hello again, Chris. I closed the blinds as quickly as I could and went to hide under the desk. But the desk is just a block, no space to hide under. I don't know what to do. I hear slow footsteps coming up the stairs. Oh god, the, the doorknob is turning. The door is locked. Oh thank god, I remembered to lock it. She is screeching from behind the door. She is slamming her hands on it. It's only a matter of time until she breaks the whole door down. What do I do? Hi, my name is Jeremy. Recently, I got laid off by my horrible boss. I found a website for deep web jobs and applied for house sitting. I also recently read Chris's shifts 
and I think we applied for the same job. Mr. Salazar emailed me something along the same lines. I'll paste his email here. Your application has been accepted. Thank you for applying to the house sitting job. You will stay at the house from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. You must follow these rules. Your money will arrive at 6 a.m. after your shift. Always, no matter what you hear or see, stay in the bedroom. Either don't bring your phone, or if you do, do not turn it on. Even if you get a notification, I will not email you during your shift. Arrive at 12 or a little before 12. If you arrive past 12, do not enter the house and send me an email. From 12 to 1, you are allowed to roam the house, but make sure to be in the upstairs bedroom by 1. Turn all the lights off, lock the doors, and close the blinds. This can happen anytime during the night. If you hear loud music from the camera room, put on the hazmat suit we have provided. Enter the camera room. Walk to the security desk. Do not interact with the security guard and turn off the music from the iPod on the desk. Make sure to do this fairly quickly. From 1 to 2, clean up all clothes in the bedroom and hang them up in the closet. If any clothes have blood stains, put them in the trash quickly. Make the bed. If there are any more than three sheets, throw away any extra. If you hear a knock at the window, hide under the bed until the entity has entered and left the room. From 2 until 3, put the hazmat suit back on and walk into the downstairs area. If there is a man watching TV, turn the TV off and ignore what the man does. If there is a woman cooking in the kitchen, then turn off the stove and ignore what she does. There is a bathroom connected to the bedroom. If you hear the shower turn on, knock on the door three times. No more, no less. If the shower stops, it was done correctly. From 3 until 3.33, lay in bed and close your eyes. Do not fall asleep. Make sure to pull the blankets up to your neck and make sure they stay there. From 3.34 until 4, your shift is complete and you are allowed to roam the house until 4. But do not leave before 4, and do not leave more than 5 minutes after 4. That is all. Your shift starts tomorrow night at 471 Peterson Drive. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I don't know what this means, but having read Chris's posts, I think I'm ready and I can survive. I'm going to type this out after my shift is over if I survive. I entered the house and looked around. Just as Chris had said, it looked old, but you could live in it just fine. The kitchen and the living room were in pristine condition and looked like they were bought yesterday. I walked up the stairs, walked down the hall, and turned right just before the camera room, entering the bedroom. The room had a king-size bed in it, with clothes and bed sheets scattered around the room. There was a door off to the side of the room, which I assumed was to the bathroom. The nightstand next to the bed had a small digital clock and a printed paper of the instructions. The clock gave a small beep signaling my time had started. I bent down and picked up a couple pieces of clothes, varying from bras to underwear to hats. I hung them up in the closet and started to get bored, until I found a grey striped shirt with a large crimson stain on it. I immediately threw it in the large garbage can in the corner of the room and continued with my work. I was picking up the last piece of clothes, ready to make the bed, when I heard five slow, hard knocks on the window across from the bed. My blood ran cold. I dropped the clothes I was holding and crawled through the small space under the bed. It was silent, until the door slammed open and a woman, fitting the description Chris gave, entered the room. I know you're in here. You can't escape. I'll find you eventually. I held my breath for as long as I could. She started to get angry and slammed her frail hands on the nearest things around her. She screamed in anger, wanting only to trap me in the house. Eventually, she left and slammed the door behind her. I got up and out from under the bed, quickly collected the sheets and made the bed making sure to throw away the extra two sheets. Only 2.45, I thought. Then came the loud music from the room next door. 
I calmly, but scaredly, put on the hazmat suit and opened the door. I cautiously stepped out into the hallway and saw down the stairs a man watching TV. I opened the door to the camera room slowly and saw a man, if you can even call it that, sitting in the chair. He had rotten, dead skin and sat with such a hunch. His back was almost at a 90 degree angle. I walked over to the desk and spotted the iPod. Keep calm, Chris. Keep calm. The guard repeated to himself. I gave him a look of sympathy as he stared up at me with terrified eyes. I grabbed the iPod and turned the music off. Chris covered his ears and kept repeating that same phrase. I walked back to the bedroom, just in time for the clock to give me a small beep and turn 2 a.m. Let's be honest, Chris is dead. The house has trapped his soul and forced him to work there for eternity. The reason I signed up was to find a way to release these trapped souls, and I think that the entity has something to do with all of this. I kept the hazmat suit on and walked down the stairs. The man was sitting on the couch watching a cooking show on the TV. I walked over to the man. He had polished hair, combed over to the side like he was a rich person. He had a nice suit and tie on and nice pants, but his face looked like it had been rotting for years. The bone was showing in more than three places, and I'm pretty sure I saw a glob of skin fall from his face. His laughs were hoarse and deep, like he didn't have any vocal cords. I turned the TV off and the man froze mid-laugh, then melted into the couch seams. I shuddered and returned to my place upstairs. I entered and took about 10 minutes to take the hazmat suit off, only to be met with the sound of a warm shower. I came close to the bathroom door and put my ear against it. I heard a lady humming lightly. Knock, knock, knock. The humming and water stopped immediately after the third knock. It felt unsettling how quickly it became silent, but faint off in the distance. I heard sizzling eggs. I quickly got the hazmat suit on and rushed down the stairs. The woman was cooking black eggs. She was like the man watching TV. Her apron and hat were pristine, spotless, but her skin was, although in better shape than the man's, rotting. I reached for the oven dial, but stopped. Please, please keep it on, please. The woman repeated with a soft voice. Regardless, I turned the dial to zero. The woman melted, and I returned back to my bedroom. I thought this was going to be easy, but now I know what Chris felt. It is insanely scary being inside the house. 2.58, I pull the bed sheets up. 2.59, I get into bed. 3 o'clock, I close my eyes and get comfortable. The bed is surprisingly soft, and I feel as if I could fall asleep even if a train was running right above me. I thought about everything else I had seen that night, and that scared me awake for a few minutes. But it was a constant struggle to stay awake and conscious but I know I would be like Chris if I fell asleep. Finally, the alarm clock beeped and the bed felt like it became stone and I climbed out confused. I now had free time to walk around the house until four. I checked in the camera room and Chris had disappeared. I waited patiently for four to come and when it did, I went home and started plotting a plan. Like many of you have suggested to Chris, tomorrow I'm going to bring a knife and a lighter. I'm going to try to stab the entity and hopefully I can survive. I'll update again tomorrow. Wish me luck. Oh Jesus, the plan did not work as planned. I'm hurt, but I survived. Let me tell you what happened. Just because many of you were asking, I went back during the day, but the house wasn't there. Like many of you proposed, I took with me a bear trap and a large knife. I entered the house and looked around. It looked the same, and I placed the bear trap right outside the bedroom. Again, like you guys suggested, I tried unplugging the TV before the man appears, but when I went to go pull it out, it was like the cable was a part of the wall. It was completely stuck, and I couldn't manage to unplug it. The night started, and it went as normal as it could, but while I was in the middle of cleaning up the clothes, I noticed the bed had no hiding space under it. I had to come up with a new plan on the spot. My plan was, while I was sleeping from 3 to 3.33 a.m., 
and the entity was above me. I would take my knife and stab her, but now it looked like I wouldn't even make it to then. Knock, knock, knock. The entity signals it's coming and I panic. Where would I hide? I grab the knife and crawl to a small space behind the door. I would have to stab her as she came in or was hit by the trap. Step. The entity comes closer. Step. I tighten my grip on the knife. Step. A bead of sweat drops down my face. Clang. I hear the sound of the bear trap closing and a high-pitched demonic scream after it. I open the door and with all my might swing at the entity in front of me. The knife slides clean into one of the entity's eyes and black goo starts spurting out from the wound. The entity screams revealing at least 100 sets of tiny sharp teeth. It clenches my hand in its mouth and I scream out in pain. Me and the entity fall over on top of each other and roll around for a while. I got scratched a couple of times and I stabbed her a couple of times. But finally, I pinned her down and stabbed until I knew without a shadow of doubt that she was dead. I stood up, my arm bleeding profusely, and used a piece of clothing to wrap my wound. I didn't care about the rules anymore. I just killed the thing running this place. I sat down on the bed and rested for a few moments. Throughout the rest of the night, nothing happened. And just to make sure, I stayed until 4 and left then. When I arrived at my house, there was a letter stapled to my door, written by Mr. Salazar. I'll rewrite what he said here. Wow, I have to say that I'm impressed. You managed to kill my best worker. It seems that you have already figured out my plan. The workers have normal shifts the first day. Then on the second day their safe place is taken away. But you, you made it to work. Come back to the house tomorrow as if it was a normal shift and we can discuss a reward. That is all. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I don't know what he will do or give me, but I don't think I have an option to not go. Wish me luck. Now, throughout my two shifts I was very calm, but after reading that letter, I was more than a little scared. I spent the day preparing, hidden knives, small gun, body armor under my clothes. I was going to be ready for whatever he was going to do. I arrived at the house and enter as normal. The inside of the house is completely different. It's no longer a house, but a chamber, a tunnel down into the earth. I slowly walk down the stairs, ready to pull out my gun. I reach the final step and arrive in a blue room with many monitors and a large man sitting in a chair. Hello, Jeremy. I am Mr. Salazar. The man turned his chair around and I got a good look at him. He had a black goatee, balding black hair, and a dark suit on. Um, hi. What is this place? This is my viewing chamber. I spend all my time here, watching the house, monitoring my workers. He had a deep, scary voice. What happened at the house after I killed that thing? Once the house lost its best worker, the other workers suspended their existence and the house will do nothing tonight. But if it doesn't have a new best worker by tomorrow, then the workers are released from the house's grip and they will destroy and kill anything they come across. So, why are you doing this? Because, Jeremy, it is simply the only way to contain these workers. Then, who is going to be the next best worker? Well, Jeremy, I'm looking right at them. His mouth twisted into a sinister grin. M me Yes, you. Killing my best worker and touching that black liquid caused a transformation to begin. In the next day, you will see your muscles and meat disappearing. Your skin will become stuck to your bones, your face will sag, your eyes will turn black and yellow, and your teeth will fall out, and you will grow an insatiable desire to return to this house. What? I'm gonna become like that thing? Unfortunately for you, yes. You can leave now if you'd like, but it is inevitable. I stood in disbelief for a few moments. Was I really going to become that thing? I turned around and ran out the door. When I came out the door, I was standing in front of my house, and behind me, the house disappeared. It's been a few hours, 
I'm noticing that I'm losing my muscles and I have a really strong feeling to go back to that cursed house. My eyes have turned a dark gray and I don't think I can stay away from the house for much longer. I know that I can't stop what's happening to me. All I can do is just go back to the house. Wish me luck. Thanks for watching Wolfpack. If you want to submit your story, my email and subreddit will be in the description below. And also, if you're not subscribed, please do if you want. And don't forget to like and comment as well. Have beautiful nightmares. And I will see you next time.